Knowledge is produced all around us at all times, and with the advent of the internet, suddenly that knowledge production can seem all the more democratic. But is it? We've got a proliferation of educational and political YouTubers, but that content is produced in a really asymmetrical way with big YouTubers and, more common on the right, big companies able to have a much larger impact than small, and in my case, criminally underrated channels. But in some ways more important than that is how ways of producing knowledge online have sometimes just entrenched epistemic ideals. That is, it has privileged certain ways of knowing. Um, these ways just reflect the capitalist, patriarchal and colonial systems. And I think a really good example of this is the proliferation of online debate culture, which is both the result of platform pressures like YouTube to just constantly churn out content like a great sewer, and a really narrow understanding of how we know things and how we should seek to create knowledge together. Wait, are you attacking the concept of debate? Can you not defend your positions on good faith? Well, I mean, I'm just... That's what I'm doing. I've got a camera. I'm filming it. I mean, you should just debate me on stream in good faith. And then if you win the debate, then you'll be right. I'm not going to debate you, man. I'm, ju I'm doing a video right now about why that's pointless. But I, I, I mean, I said it was good faith. Not good faith. No. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The problems with knowledge creation online and how that interacts with capitalism, patriarchy and coloniality. Well, that just sounds like bad faith. I think a good place to start with how knowledge production works online is to look at the structures of platforms like YouTube, to look at what, uh, what pressures exist to encourage what behaviours, what kind of content and what kind of knowledge production is, is encouraged. Also, this isn't like an anti-bread tube video or anything, like, I'm just as subject to these pressures as anyone else on the platform, and I think left YouTube has the potential to do, you know, good things, which is why I do it. All the money I make, just, I'm, I'm drowning in it. I am now the bourgeois. So don't take this as an attack on the form or on any particular YouTuber or streamer, unless I mention someone by name, or heavily imply it. See, that's me drama posting to keep you watching. So let's think for a moment about what YouTube is. YouTube is not a democratic body of knowledge creation, obviously. It's a corporate platform run for profit. So particular groups and particular creators are going to be advantaged over others. There's a reason that PragerU gets lots of views, and it's not because of their rigorous commitment to the truth. It's because they have all that oil money. And with the oil money comes the ability to buy in, buy their way onto a platform. Comes the ability to buy professional equipment and professional editors. And not just have to fuck around like me. I like calling uh, PragerU content creators, by the way. There's just something deeply funny about the idea of crusty old Dennis Prager having to do TikTok dances to go viral. Yeah. Funny and deeply cursed. YouTube is also a platform of massive audience inequality, where a few large channels dominate and the rest of us scramble around looking for subs. Now, this isn't a complaint about big channels or my small sub count. Rather, it's just to point out how deeply unequal this platform is and who has the power to generate discourse or whose voices have reach. And consequently, who has the most resources? Because big channels make money. This then incentivizes us in a kind of capitalist market logic to always be looking for ways to grow our channel, to always be looking for ways to increase our views. Uh, and as much as we don't like it, it does introduce elements of competition, which we will get to again later on. A video isn't bread tube unless at some point they say, but we'll come back to that later. But it also gives huge amounts of power to people who might not have particular understandings of topics to talk about. Again, think about how much power PragerU has to influence knowledge on certain topics, despite them all being 
uniformly dipshits. At Prager University, five minutes is all the time we need to communicate many of the most important ideas in life. If you're black or female or Muslim or Hispanic or member of any other minority group, you're judged differently than the most evil of all things, a white Christian male. Or me here, like I'm talking about digital structures and epistemology, which are topics which are outside my area of expertise. Like I could be talking shite and no one could really stop me. This is beyond just like the big corporate channels who have much bigger uh, platforms than even the biggest left YouTuber, but it does still encompass our tiny little slab bubble. Slab didn't sound right slab of YouTube because there's obviously huge inequality even within our little YouTube bubble and in some ways those inequalities clearly reflect offline oppressions and while we do have some diversity on left YouTube with like two of the biggest channels here are run by trans women which is great but it's still overwhelmingly white and um, I know don't worry and it's still overwhelmingly Western focused again I know, don't worry. There's a well-worn and recurrent topic of the whiteness of BreadTube, which speaks to this phenomenon. And this has some interesting implications. This isn't just a matter of like representation, but is deeply related to how knowledge is produced online. Take for example the concept of standpoint epistemology, which essentially makes the point that knowledge isn't just a thing that we all have equal access to, but is instead socially situated. Think about how a white person may not know about the personal experience of being racially oppressed within a white supremacist society, but a black person might. That knowledge is not equally attainable between the two groups of people. If you have a set of high impact creators who come from particular uh, racial, class, uh, western based perspective, then that group, our group, is going to have more ready access to some forms of knowledge over others. The tendency then is going to be to reproduce ways of knowing from those positions. And this is why you get people like Vosh, Drama Post, Beef Post, instinctively reacting badly to things like uh, black nationalism or indigenous politics. Because instinctively those particular frames are challenging to his knowledge base. Beef, beef, beef. But we have to be careful here. Because I'm not saying that these epistemic issues would be magically fixed if we suddenly got uh, more high subscriber channels from different social groups that change would be at best aesthetic. It might produce some positive changes, but ultimately we're at risk of elite capture, of placing a few privileged voices in the stratified, unequal knowledge producing system of YouTube and simply creating more distant elite voices. Any standpoint theory should be constructive rather than deferential. It should challenge the construction of something like YouTube rather than just change the actors within it. The problem with knowledge production on YouTube is that it is a private, corporate, non-democratic body that simply reproduces the oppressions and inequalities that exist offline, which includes the suppression of alternative forms of knowledge, which again, we'll get to later. But we'll come back to that later. The prevalence of a particular white and Western demographic is as much an effect of the structure here as it is a cause. Another issue here, I think, is that even the very limited form of peer review that exists on this site, um, response videos, tend to be viewed as an opportunity for dunking and for like beef generation rather than any serious and cooperative attempt to, to criticize and to improve on knowledge. But if a channel like, I don't know, We're in Hell decided to do a response to this video, the pressure wouldn't be to soberly interact with my work and to create a higher standard of knowledge. It would be to do dunks, uh, to, to make beef, 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 to find drama, drama, because it's more entertaining. And if it's more entertaining, more people will watch and it plays into the growth logic of this platform. I'm not saying we're in hell would do this. I'm just saying that the pressure to do so is strong. Beef me! Interestingly, I read a paper which argued this tendency didn't really exist on BreadTube, but if there was a time it didn't, it definitely does now, especially in the debate sphere. 
So really, there's no excuse we're in hell. Beef me! Alright, so this is the last point I want to make in this section, which has already gone on way, way, way too long already. YouTube wants you to make lots of videos. It wants you to upload lots of content because that's how it makes money. For the love of money. Gotta make them money. So it encourages you, it rewards you for frequent uploads, which obviously encourages less careful work. I think this is partly why streaming and debate content has become so prevalent on YouTube recently. It simply takes much less time to react and dunk on a video of Ben Shapiro saying some inane bullshit or, I don't know, debating someone from your Discord than it does to research, write, produce and edit a video essay. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that streaming or streamers are inherently bad or not producing good content. There's plenty that do. Serfs, love them. SK the Crusader, absolutely. I'm however saying that the proliferation of the streaming and debate content is the direct result of the exact same forces which encourage poorly researched, hastily put together content at the direct expense of more carefully researched video essays. I'm not saying that all video essays are automatically good either. I've made plenty bad ones and this might be one of them now. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Some people have argued that knowledge on YouTube is dominated by people who know how to game the algorithm. But I don't think that's really true. It's more like people are encouraged to conform to the pressures of an algorithm which is designed to generate profit and that in turn creates specific pressures on the type and quality of knowledge produced. If you conform to that, you're rewarded. You're not gaming anything, it's gaming you. The apotheosis, however, of all of these negative forms of knowledge creation that exist on YouTube, that are encouraged by the YouTube algorithm, is, I think, debate. Bad faith. Bad faith. I'm gonna have to move to get away from this guy. <sighs> right. So there's plenty of videos now about how debate as a form isn't about elucidating any idea of the truth or coming to any understanding about knowledge. Sarah Z and Bad Empanada particularly both have good videos about this, so I'm not just going to reproduce those arguments there, I want to add to them, add something new to them. Firstly, I think one of the reasons that debate content has blown up recently on left YouTube is because it is relatively easy to produce compared to say like a 30 minute video essay and the platform rewards you for making lots of content, so you can pump out loads and you'll be rewarded for it. Several people have made this argument before uh, before me, it's well trodden stuff, but I think what, I think the issue with this proliferation of debate is that it further embedded the idea that debate is a legitimate way of finding out whether something is correct and true. This is another example of YouTube's structures influencing how knowledge is produced. The platform encourages certain types of content which then impacts how both viewers and other content creators view knowledge creation. And this might not be an issue if debate related at all to any sort of truth. And the problem is, it doesn't, it just doesn't. And as Sarah Z points out, it's a game and people who've done competitive debates know this because they frequently argue positions that they don't agree with. Winning is related to rhetoric, not any underlying correctness. Is the word right? Correct truthfulness, truthiness. And you can see this quite often when you look at online debates and like someone will produce a stat or a fact and it will flummox the opponent and they'll be like, oh yes, I won that debate. Um, but then the moment you look into this stat or fact, it's either applied completely wrong or totally misleadingly if the fact exists at all. Um, this graph is not relevant to what we were talking about. <laughs> like, cause of course this is one of the dangers of doing these things live, right? You know, the, yeah, like, of course. you know, somebody brings something up, you know, you say, you know, you give the fact as you remember it. And of course you just, if they say that's not true, it's, I mean, what are you going to do? Right. I mean and this sort of thing highlights how the purpose of debate is to win and not really much else, which again is fine, I guess, if we accept it's a game, if 
but if we start basing political knowledge around it, that's maybe not great. And these problems are compounded by the structures of Twitch and YouTube, which are so heavily reliant on the parasocial fan creator relationship. These parasocial relationships have been present for ages, like throughout cinema, music, throughout YouTube. Um, but with streaming and the direct line of communication between a fan and a creator on stream, it has the potential to become much, much stronger. And again, I don't know if this is necessarily negative, but within the context of a growing debate culture in which good and sound knowledge creation is mixed up with this game of rhetoric which is deeply entangled with parasocial fan re relationships, I think it can have some especially negative effects. Suddenly the game aspect of debates is exaggerated in certain ways. You have these debates which are framed like boxing matches with creators and thumbnails like gurning at each other. You have like fans of particular creators having pitched battles on Twitter and YouTube attacking or def instinctively defending someone for espousing a bad or harmful position. Again this might be <laughs> weird but ultimately fine if people saw it as a game and weren't basing deeply held political beliefs off of this parasocial sporting event as if it was a good and reliable setting for knowledge and understanding. But they're not. And trying to understand complex topics is muddied by these strong parasocial relationships, the gamified aspect of online debate and the very nature of debate itself. I don't know, sometimes I think content creators forget that when we're making stuff, we could very easily be talking to children or teenagers, like impressionable people, people who are just finding their feet politically. And I don't know, it seems like there's no one question whether it seems a bit gross to make money off of this, off of reproducing bad knowledge, off of making a game that makes it seem like you'd know more than other people. And, humiliating other people with bad knowledge. I don't know. It seems weird to me. It, it, like it worries me that I might uh, have undue influence over someone's political opinions. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have watched that Bo Burnham special. And I also think that uh, debate has had an impact on what people consider evidence online. Because it's competitive and often rapid fire, the format encourages you to like hit your opponent with stats and facts and figures because they just appear more convincing. It's like an aesthetic scientism or, or a performative rationality where numbers make you right. Rarely and especially online do debates allow for a long, slow explanation of, say, theoretical perspectives, or even just qualitative evidence. And the odd time that it does happen, you get this sort of reaction. And this has, I think, led to a, a strange understanding uh, of what constitutes evidence. I get this all the time with my videos. People will say it's like not well evidenced if it's just argued coherently. It has to include some specific quantitative data to be considered legitimate. And this is just like a fundamental misunderstanding of how evidence works within an argument or what evidence is. And you can see it reflected in people who do debates and, and what they say. For example, there was a since deleted tweet by one of the worst of the debate lot. This is beef posting again. Beef me! Um, one of the worst of the debate lot, Socialism Done Left, did this tweet. Anecdotal evidence has no place in policy discussions. Empathy can and should help shape your goals, but anecdotal empathy cannot meaningfully inform you on what policies effectively achieve said goals or how they do so. They meant to say anecdotal evidence again, right? Anecdotal empathy, it, it, that's, that's not a thing. Is that a thing? Hmm, bad tweet.
And there was another one by the ironically named Know Nothing who, who tweeted this. Sorry, but I could not give less of a fuck about your lived experiences if we are having a policy discussion. Lived experience is just a woke repackaging of anecdotal evidence. And I saw those tweets and I thought, fuck, I'm going to have to totally redo my entire PhD methodology because I'm just interviewing a diverse range of people with diverse lived experiences to try and understand specific social phenomenon. And obviously, that doesn't count as evidence, so I'm just going to have to completely rejig the whole thing and just look at stats instead. It's weird how, how I got allowed, um, permission to do that within an academic structure since it doesn't include evidence. So what this tendency of these debaters um, and, and this general debate trend does is it specifically makes all knowledge reductionist. I don't mean this as a criticism in itself, it's just that's what specifically what quantitative data does. It reduces social phenomenon to uh, testable variables and hypothesis, and that's fine, but elevating that above other forms of knowledge as like the most legitimate form of knowledge carries with it loads of assumptions about the nature of social phenomenon and the nature of human actors. And I think privileging this pseudo-rationalist and pseudo-scientific ideal of quantitative knowledge as inherently better reinforces a neoliberal capitalist ideal of what the human is, of the human as a rational actor, and of the world as a set of testable, reducible, and rational social phenomena. And I don't think I have to spell out why it might be bad for the left to operate on the terms of capitalists. We don't want to do that. We want to change those terms if you're really on the left. And there are other issues like this which emerge from the privileging of quantification. Suddenly abstract critique from outside a particular framework is seen as illegitimate because it doesn't fit within a narrow quantifiable understanding of the world, which obviously makes criticising the terms of society much, much harder. And finally on this, connected to the idea of debate as a game and as battle between different creators and different fans, debate online reinforces certain assumptions about how knowledge should be created, not as a collaborative exercise where we come to collective understanding together, but as an individualistic battle between two perspectives where one will ultimately win out and vanquish the other. Um, it, it privileges individualism in the sphere of knowledge creation over any sort of collectivist understanding. To be clear here, I, I'm not saying that if you have ever engaged in debates that you're necessarily engaging in capitalist propaganda, rather that there are tendencies within particularly online debate which prioritise and fetishise quantitative knowledge at the expense of other forms. And this is consistent with and potentially reinforces neoliberal and capitalist ideals of the individual as a separable object of analysis within society, while making it much harder to criticise the terms of society itself, which we on the left should be able to recognise as bad. That's not great. But there's one last thing you've got to remember with online debate, and this is true of YouTube as well, and it's that it's not a new thing necessarily, it's just a new expression of older forms. Specifically, debate culture finds its roots in the university. It's found within a particular Western epistemic framework, which is something we should probably at least challenge. <coughs> that was very bad faith. Oh my god, fuck off! So, I think it's true that YouTube sort of replicates and bastardizes aspects of knowledge creation from the university. Debate is a really good example, and we can see the differences in how these fields operate when you look at the debate between Richard Wolff and Destiny. Like, on the one hand, you had Destiny trying to over-quantify, trying to 
get one over on, on this professor who had decades of experience in the field, almost trying to quantify a social theory. And on the other, you had Professor Wolf uh, just slowly trying to explain things uh, in quite a frustrated manner. Could I finish or do you need to tell me about the Mondragon Corporation? I, I didn't mean to interrupt your lecture. I'm sorry. Continue. Sure you did. Come on. And the reaction, the reaction to this was summed up by this tweet from, I think, Rational Disconnect. But the reason why this is important isn't because online debate has taken something like pure and made it bad, it's taken something good and bastardised it, but that it has inherited the deeply rooted epistemic issues that come with the university as an institution. So the university first developed as uh, religious institutions before being uh, reformed and secularised during the Enlightenment. So with this particular European and Enlightenment development, the university came to embody certain epistemic ideals and it came to privilege certain types of knowledge above others. For example, within the humanities and social sciences, there's a particular European academic canon which is constantly referenced alongside a particular narrative about the development of thought. So for example, I just think of my personal experience, particularly during my undergraduate politics degree. In all the political philosophy classes that I took, which were core to the degree, there was always this particular narrative established that like, here are a particular Greek philosophers who established the thinking for these liberal male philosophers. And the story which runs up through those years is the development of political thought. The development of political thought. Really where women or even anti-capitalists mentioned in these political philosophy courses, and never never was non-Western thought referenced. And what this does is, is reinforce two narratives. One, that Europe or Western civilization is a cohesive thing. And secondly, it reinforces that this story is the only story in knowledge. It is the only story in the development of political thought. Or at the very least, it is the only story that matters. But more than this, so much of Western knowledge, particularly as it's expressed through the class stratified system of the university, which remember is where first academic and then online debate comes from, so much of it stems from a particular Cartesian ideal of knowledge creation. We're all familiar with Descartes' famous uh, I think therefore I am, right? Well this ideal, the legacy of which is still defining what does and doesn't constitute valid knowledge, is replicated throughout online cultures, particularly in debate. So this epistemic ideal splits the subject, that is mere you, from the object, that is what we're studying, and creates this ideal of objectivity. As if, again, knowledge is a thing separate from the knower, which can be universally obtained in the same way. Knowledge is conceived of as a universal object rather than as a particular social relation. Isn't that right? I like his wee hat. It makes him look very charming. So knowledge within the West, because of this Cartesian ideal, privileges the idea that the world is made up of these knowable objects, rather than that it is the relation between things which gives something its essence, or even that it is the relation that is the thing itself. It so often ignores that knowledge isn't just a thing that is internal to something called the self, but is a relation between the self and the community, the self and society, the self and whatever something called the economy is. And this is, I think, really closely related to the privileging of quantitative data that we've seen in like the debate sphere, um, because it tends to reduce these complex social relations into quantifiable objects. And if then, if we, if we go back to debate for a second, I think we can see this really, really clearly. So think about the way that Destiny and other debaters try to reduce complex issues into these mad hypotheticals to like ground their moral axioms, whatever the fuck they're talking about. None of these are just isolated instances. Like I know, I know we want to break it down into like, do you think X or Y, yes or no? Do you think X or Y, yes or no? And then based the on that, why, but it's, it's such a multifaceted yeah. issue. Like none of but this happens well, in a yeah, vacuum, yeah. I, right? I understand, but when we say multifaceted, yeah. That single facet's coming together to form the multifacet. And this is an example of how we're trained to view things in their most essential aspects as somehow being like their truest being, their truest form. 
In reality though, it's the relations between things, the context in which things exist that gives them their being. The world isn't just a series of self-defined objects which are connected even in complex ways, but it's the connections, the relation is the thing. Debate culture then as a sort of bastardised offshoot of the university reinforces this sort of liberal western ideal of knowledge and of the self as a knower. But why does that matter? Why is it bad to reinforce certain types of knowledge over others? So if we think about the universalising of what knowledge is and how we should seek to know things, we can see that not only is it a statement about how we know, but about who has the ability to know and what it means for personhood if somebody knows differently. Take the famous, I think therefore I am. On the face of it, it just seems fine, you know, not controversial, not really that bad. How, how could that hurt anyone? But when you consider everything I've talked about and the privileging of this type of knowledge above any others, we can see how this phrase could easily go from I think therefore I am to I cannot think therefore I am not. People who don't subscribe to this Cartesian epistemic ideal are viewed by this universalizing, totalizing logic as simply less than human. And to keep with the Western narrative, any alternative forms of knowledge had to be destroyed in this genocidal act. Take for example how indigenous peoples in the Americas were viewed as essentially less than human because they had alternative forms of knowledge. Part of which was about not viewing the land as something external to them, which is different from the Cartesian self-object split. Uh, and they therefore didn't have a concept of property ownership. This was then used as justification for the civilizing mission of colonialism and the genocide of indigenous peoples. Thanks John Locke, good job liberals. This genocide included the destruction of indigenous written knowledge as well as the destruction of native peoples and the establishment of a settler state. So not only were people who didn't subscribe to this particular Cartesian ideal viewed of as less human, but the destruction of other forms of knowledge was fundamental in their genocide. Similarly, the knowledge and traditions of African slaves were devalued and destroyed, and their different system of knowledge was viewed of as evidence for their inferiority. This devaluation of the capacity of African slaves to know things has morphed over the years and today finds similar expression in the bell curve style arguments of, of black people have lower IQ that sort of bullshit. This isn't just confined to the past, this is still being expressed in this fundamental uh, epistemic ideal. The idea that some people know worse as part of their dehumanization and it's still going on today. And this destruction of knowledge and this dehumanization wasn't just confined to the colonial context either. As Federici argues, the witch trials in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries were essential for the formalization of patriarchy within capitalism, and were in part attacks against alternative forms of knowledge, and therefore alternative forms of power, that non-noble women had too. Why this matters? <laughs> in short then, fucking hell. Oh. One day I'm going to do a video that isn't uh, grim, it isn't, I start, this started off as a nice light thing about YouTube, now we're on genocide. How does this happen? We don't know. <laughs> in short, why it matters is that when that one particular form of knowledge is privileged within structures like the university, from which traditions like debate form and then uh, are adapted to the online context, is that this trajectory reinforces the idea that such knowledge is universal and better. Which reinforces the idea that such people who don't subscribe to such ideals are less than people. And it plays a central role in reinforcing the terms of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. So when someone like Vosh tweets something like this, Hundreds of thousands of people, millions maybe, have had their politics swayed through debate streams, which are just another type of content people may or may not have a preference for. This snobbery has a message. Sean thinks less of you if streams brought you to the left. Not only is this deeply, viscerally, fundamentally hilarious, like I can feel it in my bones, it's so funny, but it misunderstands that even if he has swayed 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions maybe, with online debate, he's also just reinforced these epistemic ideals that are essential in the reproduction of the very thing he says he wants to overturn. It's like we were talking about earlier, it's not enough to just have different or more people occupying a particular space. We need to fundamentally alter the construction of that space, and that involves altering how we view knowledge. We need to change the terms and not just the content of the conversation. As Mignolo argues, The world cannot be changed if the knowledge and the knower of the world do not change. So I almost feel silly about pinning all these dense and deep consequences onto what is essentially edutainment, but I feel like the left has to be aware that the structures of YouTube create certain negative tendencies for the construction of good knowledge. And the worst of that is expressed in debate content, which both embodies some of the like worst pressures of the platforms as well as inheriting really regressive ideals of the privileging of certain types of particularly quantitative knowledge, which is related to uh, Eurocentric, patriarchal, colonial and capitalist ideals of knowledge creation. Now I'm not saying that we should stop streaming or stop making YouTube videos, because I do think that we can do some like really good and useful work on this platform, but I am saying that we should be aware of the limitations of what can be achieved on these corporate platforms, and, and we have to be aware of how these platforms might uh, create pressures which negatively impact the knowledge that we produce here. What I am saying is stop doing debates. Just stop it. Stop doing them. They're pointless, they're useless, they reinforce bad ideals of knowledge creation, uh, and unless you're doing them as a game in which you're very clear that their relationship to the truth is less than ideal, just stop doing them. We can think of new, non-competitive, cooperative ways to create knowledge and understanding together. We don't need debates. Stop it. If there's one thing you get from this, stop doing debates. Do you still want to debate me? Do you just want to talk about things in a non-competitive realm? Thus ends my silly didactic play. And see. How was that? Is that good? What do you mean? Who, who are you talking to? What do you mean? Talk to you. There's, the camera. there's no one here behind the camera. You just, you just did a 40 minute YouTube video. And you, I mean, I, no, listen to me. You just did a 40 minute YouTube video about knowledge and you, you thought there was someone behind the camera helping you? You thought you had friends? I don't even know what this bit is. I don't know what any of these bits are. The guy coming in the room. I, you, you thought what? Thought it might be funny. It, no, it's not funny. It wasn't funny. Nobody really understands what's going on here. So why don't you just sit there and I'll read out the credits, you fucking dipshit. All right. For anyone still around and dealing with my slow descent into uh, madness. Here's the credits. So first of all, massive thanks to Lila, Leech, Wifro on Twitter, uh, We're in Hell and Arnok for the use of their beautiful voices. Also massive thanks to my patrons for helping me get through this video and get through my, my PhD. Uh, particular thanks to Paul Singleton, Tamash Kispeter, Seamus Morrison, Stephanie Beverly, Sinan Kos, Jam Tabot, Nelly Zacheva, Mercutio, Daniel Hughes, Hey Joe, Luke Evans, Mackenzie Ayer, Gary Dillon, Teo Adiwali, Some Dumbass, Callum, Petrov1989, Sankara Stan77, Paul Bartley, Peter Bakalek, uh, Jam Tapot, Charlie Hallam, Dan Wheatley, James Fielder, Jane Pickering, Tyler Dadayo, and Lila, who wants you to know that I'm still not as tall as that Army, Han Army Hammer, although that's just barely, you know, I'm nearly there. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to support me too, then you can go to patreon.com slash johntheduncan or give a one-off donation using Kofi. So, thanks for watching and get me through this slow descent into hell. Don't do debates. <laughs>